Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, using observation, that's our topic for today. Uh, and we'll be discussing uh, observation as a data collection tool or a technique. The distinctive features of observation as a research process is that it offers an investigator the opportunity to gather live data from naturally occurring social situations. In this way, the researcher can look directly at what is taking place in situ rather than relying on second-hand accounts. What people do may differ from what they say they do. And observation provides a reality check. Observation also enables a researcher to look afresh at everyday behavior that otherwise might be taken for granted, expected, or uh, go unnoticed. Observation can be of facts such as the number of books in a classroom, the number of students in a class, the number of students who visit the school library in a given period. It can also focus on events as they happen in a classroom, for example, the amount of teacher and student talk, the amount of task conversation, and the amount of group collaborative work. Further, it can focus on behaviors or qualities, such as the friendliness of the teacher, the degree of aggressive behavior, or the extent of unsociable behavior among students. What counts as evidence becomes cloudy immediately in observation, because what we observe depends on when, where, and for how long we look, how many observers there are, and how we look. It also depends on what is taken to be evidence of, or a proxy of, or a proxy for, an underlying latent construct. What counts as acceptable evidence of unsocial behavior? It requires an operational definition. It, it requires an operational definition that is valid and reliable. Observers need to decide uh, what is the observation evidence. For example, is the degree of wear and tear on a book in the school library an indication of its popularity or carelessness by its readers? are of destructive behavior of students. One cannot infer cause from effect, intention from observation, stimulus from response. Observations enable the researcher to gather data on the physical setting. For example, the physical environment and its organization, the human setting, for example, the organization of people, the characteristics and makeup of the groups, or individuals being observed, for instance, gender, class, the interactional setting, for example, the interactions that are taking place, formal, informal, planned, unplanned, verbal, nonverbal. The program setting, for example, the resources and their organization, pedagogic styles, curricula, and their organization. Observational data may be useful for recording nonverbal behavior, behavior in natural or contrived setting, and longitudinal studies, or longitudinal 
analysis. On the other hand, the lack of control in observing in natural settings may render observation less useful coupled with difficulties in measurement, problems of small samples, difficulties of gaining access and negotiating entry, and difficulties in maintaining anonymity. Observation can be a powerful research tool, but it is not without its difficulties. The kind of observations available to the researcher lie on a continuum from, from unstructured to structured responses responsive to preordinate. A highly structured observation will know in advance what it is looking for and will have its observation categories worked out in advance. A semi-structured observation will have an agenda of issues but will gather data to illustrate these issues in a far less predetermined or systematic manner. An unstructured observation will be far less clear on what it is looking for and will therefore have to go into a situation and observe what is taking place before deciding on its significance for the research. In a nutshell, a structured observation will already have its hypotheses decided and will use the observational data to confirm or refute these hypotheses. On the other hand, a semi-structured and more particularly an unstructured observation will be hypothesis generating rather than hypothesis testing. The semi-structured and unstructured observation will review observational data before suggesting an explanation for the phenomena being observed. Though it is possible to argue that all research is some form of participant observation since we cannot study the world without being part of it. Nevertheless, Gold 1958 offers a well-known classification of researcher roles in observation that lie on a continuum. At one end is the complete participant moving to the participant as observer, thence to the observer as participant, and finally to the complete observer. This move is from complete participation to complete detachment. The midpoints of this continuum strive to balance involvement with detachment, closeness with distance, familiarity with strangeness. The role of the complete observer is typified in the one-way mirror the video cassette, the audio cassette, and the photograph, while complete participation involves researchers taking on membership roles overt or covered. The structured observation takes much time to prepare, but the data analysis is fairly rapid. The categories having already been established, while the less structured approach is, is quicker to prepare, but the data take much longer to analyze. Key issues emerge from the observation rather than the researcher knowing in advance what those key issues will be. Structured observation is useful for testing hypotheses, while unstructured observation provides a rich description of a situation which in turn can lead to the subsequent generation of hypotheses. 
different dimensions of observation whether the observation is direct or indirect the former requiring the presence of the observer the latter requiring the recording devices for example video cameras whether the presence of the observer is known or unknown overt or covered whether the researcher is concealed uh, for example through a one way mirror or hidden camera are partially concealed that is the researcher is seen but not known to be a researcher for example researcher takes up a visible role in the school the role taken by the observer a participant to non participant uh, observation structured observation a structured observation is very systematic and enables the researcher to generate numerical data from the observations numerical data in turn facilitate the making of comparisons between settings and situations and frequencies patterns and trends to be noted are calculated the observer adopts a passive non intrusive role merely noting down the incidence of the factor the factors being studied observations are entered on an observational schedule uh look at the diagram it is a kind of schedule and uh, when it is filled up it would look like this this is an example of a schedule used to monitor student and teacher conversations over a 10 minute period the upper seven categories uh here they are student to student student to students student to teacher student students to teacher and teacher to student teacher to students student to self and uh, these are the seven ones and task in hand previous task future task and non task this is an example of a schedule used to monitor student and teacher conversations over a 10 minute period the up and upper seven categories indicate who is speaking to whom while the low four categories indicate the nature of the task so uh, in in every 30 minutes uh, this uh, this column show the a 30 minute second 30 seconds sorry 30 seconds duration and during that period who talked to who the conversation took place between who the participants student to student and if it took place it is marked as a check uh, on the table in a slot so this is an example of a schedule used to monitor student and teacher conversations over a 10 minute period the upper seven categories indicate who is speaking to whom while the lower four categories indicate the nature of the talk about a diagram uh, student to student there are four instances student to students two student to teacher four student to teacher five teacher to student two and teacher to students and student to self none each column represents a 30 second time interval that is the movement from left to right represents the chronology of the sequence and the researcher has to enter data in the appropriate cell of the matrix 
every 30 seconds and it is further explained in the coming uh, slides. The researcher will need to decide what entry is to be made in the appropriate category. For example, a tick, a forward slash, a, a backward slash, a numeral one, two, three, etc., a letter A, B, C, etc., a tally mark. So, what our code be understood by all the researchers any of the codes from the tick to the slash to the backslash to a numeral a letter or to a tally mark can be used if there is a team of researchers working on a project uh, so whatever code be understood by all researchers can be used and it must be simple and quick to enter on the sheet. Better symbols rather than words which take more time to enter the data. Bearing in mind that every 30 seconds, one or more entries must be made in each column, the researcher will need to become proficient in fast and accurate data entry of the appropriate codes. Before applying this sheet to the actual uh, people, observants, it's better to pilot a structure observation schedule. It would help the research to decide the foresight of the observation. For example, people as well as events. The frequency of the observations, for example, every 30 seconds, every minute, every two minutes. The length of the observation period, for example, one hour, 20 minutes, what counts as evidence? For example, how a behavior is defined and operationalized, the nature of the entry, the coding system, what code would be used. The structured observation must address several key principles. For example, the choice of the environment, the choice of the environment such that there will be opportunities for the behavior to be observed, to be actually occurring. The availability and frequency of the behavior of interest to the observer, a key feature if unusual or special behavior is sought. The need for clear and unambiguous measures, particularly if a Latin characteristic or construct is being operationalized. A manageable number of variables, a sufficient number for validity to be demonstrated, yet not so many as to render data entry unreliable, overt or covered observation, continuous time series or random observation, the different categories of behavior to be observed, the number of people to be observed, the number of variables on which data must be gathered, the kind of observation schedule to be used. For a non-participant observation, before deciding the final plan, a checklist of design tasks should be carried out. 
Number one, the preliminary task. Make sure that you have clearly described the research problem, stated the precise aim of the research, developed an explanation which either links your research to a theory or says why the observations should be made, stated the hypothesis, if any, to be tested, identified the appropriate test statistic, if needed. Number two, the observational system. Have you identified the type or types of behavior to be observed? Have you developed clear and objective definitions of each category of behavior? Have you checked that the categories are complete and cover all the target behaviors? Have you checked that each category is clearly distinct from the others? And have you checked that the differences between each category are easily seen in the observing situation. Number three, the observational process. Have you identified an appropriate location to make your observations? Have you decided which data sampling procedure to use? Have you decided whether to use overt or covered observation? Have you decided whether to use one or more observers to collect information? And finally, have you designed the data collection sheet, reviewed the ethical standards of the investigation, run a pilot study, and made any necessary amendments to the observation system uh, procedure. If more than one observer has been used, made a preliminary assessment of inter-observer reliability so that all observer rate it in the same way. Assess and the same criterion or standard. The next step is how to enter the data. There are five principal ways of entering data into a structured observation schedule. And they are number one, event sampling, number two, instantaneous sampling, number three, interval recording, number four, rating scales, and number five, duration recording. Let's take them one by one. Event sampling. Event sampling, also known as a sign system. It requires a tally mark to be entered against each statement each time it is observed. For example, uh, observation is on the observation sheet. Teacher shouts at child how many times? mark ticks. Child shouts at teacher. Parent shouts at teacher. And teacher shouts at parent. The researcher will need to devise statements that yield the data that answer the research questions. This method is useful for finding out the frequencies are incidents of observed situations or behaviors so that comparisons can be made we can tell for example that the teacher does most shouting and that the parent shouts least of all there are only two ticks however while these data enable us to chart the incidence of observed situations, our behaviors, the difficulty with them is that we are unable to determine 
the chronological order in which they occurred. Uh, in, in this uh, table, you can see the first one says that teacher shouts at child there are one, two, three, four, five ticks, but wha we don't know in a sequence or in a chronologi chronological order that uh, between different shouts which occur when. So to overcome this problem, for example, two different stories could be told if we know the sequence or if we put them in a sequence. From uh, two different stories could be told from these data if the sequence of events were known. If the data were presented in a chronology, one story could be seen as follows, where the numbers 1 to 7 are the different periods of time for example, every 30 seconds. So teacher shouts at child. So that is number 2, 3, 4, 5, and 7. And child shouts at teacher 1, 2, and 6. Parent shouts at teacher number 2 and number 5. And teacher shouts at parent number 5 and 6. So they are now ordered in a chronological order and they can be interpreted in a narrative form. The story can be built up by looking at this data. Very simple, but it is meaningful. One interpretation could be that the child comes late and the teacher shouts at the child. The child then shouts back at the teacher. And then parent shouts, uh, the child goes out when the parents are still in the premises of the school and they brought and they bring the parent back and the parent shouts at teacher. And as a result, teacher later on shouts at parent. Another data entry could be in the form of instantaneous sampling. So what is instantaneous sampling? If it is important to know the chronology of events, then it is necessary to use instantaneous sampling, sometimes called time sampling. Time sampling. Here researchers enter what they observe at standard intervals of time. For example, every 20 seconds, every minute, etc. On the stroke of that interval, the researcher notes what is happening at that uh, precise moment and enters it into the appropriate category on the schedule. For example, Imagine that the sampling will take place every 30 seconds. Number 1 to 7 represent each 30 second interval in this way. Instant, instantaneous sampling. So teacher smiles at child. 1, 2, 3, and 4. Child smiles at teacher. 3, 4, 5, and 6. Teacher smiles at parent. 1, 2, 3, and 4 and parent smiles at teacher, three, four, five, and six. Then, there is an interval recording. This method, that is interval recording, charts the chronology of events to some extent, and like instantaneous sampling, requires the data to be entered in the appropriate category at fixed intervals. However, 
instead of charting what is happening on the instant, it charts what has happened during the period, during the preceding interval. So for example, if recording were to take place every 30 seconds, then the researcher would note down in the appropriate category what had happened during the preceding 30 seconds. The next is a rating scale. And in this method of uh, and data entry, the researcher is asked to make some judgment about the events being observed and to enter responses into a rating scale. For example, RAG 1994 suggests that observed teaching behavior might be entered onto rating scales by placing the observed behavior onto a continuum in this way. That you have the two extremes. Warm and aloof are stimulating and dull a business like a slip short, casual. And you have uh, to take the number between one to five, one closer to one end and five the highest to the other end. And on this continuum, uh, the data could be uh, entered by looking at how, w whether the behavior was warm or aloof. And there, it's not like a dichotomous that they, they are just two categories. But here the scale is uh, on a continuum and it can vary from one to five to give the exact or precise uh, understanding of the behavior. Well, there are certain guidelines for directing observations of specific activities, events, or scenes. So, directing observation. These are who is the group seen activity who's taking part. How many people are there? Their identities and their characteristics. How do participants come to be members of the group or event or activity? What is taking place? How routine, regular, pattern, irregular and repetitive are the behaviors observed. What resources are being used in the scene? How are activities being described, justified, explained, organized, labeled? How do different participants behave towards each other? What are the statuses and roles of the participants? Who is making decisions and for whom? What is being said and by whom? What is being discussed frequently or infrequently? What appear to be the significant issues that are being discussed? What non-verbal communication is taking place? Who is talking and who is listening? Where does the event take place? When does the event take place? And how long does the event take? How is time used in the event? How are the individual elements of the event connected? How are change and stability managed? What rules govern the social organization of? and behavior in the event. Why is this event occurring? And occurring in the way that 
it is. What meanings are participants attributing to what is happening? What are the history, goals and values of the group in question? These are some of the guidelines we should be uh, kept in mind while preparing for the observation, deciding about the observation as a data collecting tool, a technique. Now we move on to discuss some main categories of information in a participant observation. So what should be observed? What should be included? Well, first of all, look at the acts. What are the specific actions? Number two, activities. Last a longer time, for instance, a week, a term, months, attendance at school, for example, a membership of a club. Look at the meanings. How participants explain the causes of, meanings of, and purposes of particular events and actions. Number four, participation. What the participants do, for example, membership of a family group, school groups, peer group, clubs and societies, extracurricular groups. Number five, relationships. Observed in the several settings and contexts in which the observation is undertaken. And number six, settings. Descriptions of the settings of the actions and behaviors observed. So these are some of the main categories of information in participant observation. In our field notes, there are certain reflections. So at the level of re reflections, uh, what should be included in field notes. Reflections on the descriptions and analyses that have been done. Reflections on the method used in the observation and data collection and analysis. Ethical issues, tensions, problems and dilemmas. The reactions of the observer to what has been observed and recorded attitude, emotion, analysis, etc. Points of clarification that have been and are need to be made and possible lines of further inquiry. Well, there are certain cautionary comments about uh, observations as a tool for collecting data. Selective attention of the observer. What we see is a function of where we look, what we look at, how we look and when we look, what we think we see, whom we look at, what is in our minds at the time of observation, what are our own interests and experiences. Number two, reactivity. Participants may change their behavior if they know that they are being observed. For example, they may try harder in class, they may feel more anxious, they may behave much better or much worse than normal. They may behave in ways which they think the researcher wishes are in ways for which the researcher tacitly signals approval, demand characteristics. The third one is attention deficit. What if the observer is distracted or looks away or misses an event? 
validity of constructs number 4 decisions have to be taken on what counts as valid evidence for a judgment for example is a smile a relaxed smile a nervous smile a friendly smile a hostile smile does looking at a person's non-verbal gestures count as a valid indicator of interaction? Are the labels an indicator used to describe the behavior of interest valid indicators of that behavior? Then selective data entry. What we record is sometimes affected by our personal judgment rather than the phenomena itself. We sometimes interpret the situation and then record our interpretation rather than the phenomena. Selective memory. If we write up our observations after the event, our memory neg neg neglects and selects data. Sometimes overlooking the need to record the contextual details of the observation. Sometimes overlooking the need to record the contextual details of the observation. No should be written either during or immediately after the observation. And finally, interpersonal matters and counter-transference. Our interpretations are affected by our judgments and preferences. What we like and what we don't like about, about what we don't like about people and their behavior. Together with the relationships that we may have developed with those being observed and the context of the situation, the researchers have to deliberately distance themselves from the situation and address reflexivity. Uh, furthermore, expectancy effects. The observer knows the hypothesis to be tested. Are the findings of similar studies or has expectations of finding certain behaviors and these may influence his or her observation. Then decision on how to, how to record. The same person in a group under observation may be demonstrating the behavior repeatedly. But nobody else in the group may be demonstrating that behavior. There is a need to record how many different people show the behavior. Number of observers. Different observers of the same situation may be looking in different directions and so there may be inconsistency, inconsistency in the result. Therefore, there is a need for training, for consistency, for clear definition of what constitutes the behavior of entry or judgment and for kinds of recording. The problem of inference. Observation can record only what happens and it may be dangerous. Without any other evidence, for example, triangulation to infer the reasons, intentions and causes and purposes that lie behind actors' behaviors. One uh, cannot always judge intention from observation. For example, a child may intend to be friendly, 
but it may be construed by an inexperienced observer as selfishness. A teacher may wish to be helpful, but the researcher may interpret it as threatening. It is dangerous to infer a stimulus from a response, an intention from an observation. Next point is related with the validity or the reliability of the observation. To ensure the researchers are the research researchers are researchers many researchers re reliability. It is likely that a training will be required so that for example all the researchers use the same operational definitions record the same observations in the same way, have good concentration, can focus on detail, can be unobtrusive but attentive, have the necessary experience to make informed judgments from the observational data. Planning observations, a checklist. In planning observations, one has to consider the following points. When, where, how and what to observe. How much degree of structure is necessary in the observation. The duration of the observation period which must be suitable for the behavior to occur and be observed. The timing of the observation period, for example, morning, afternoon, or in the evening. Then the context of the observation, a meeting, a lesson, a development workshop, a senior management briefing, etc. And the nature of the observation, whether it would be structured, semi-structured, open, molar, a molecular. The need for there to be an opportunity to observe, for example, to ensure that there is the presence of the people to be observed or the behavior to be observed. The merging of subjective and objective observation, even in a structured observation, an observation schedule can become highly subjective when it is being completed as interpretation, selection and counter transference may enter the observation and operational definitions may not always be sufficiently clear. The value of covered participant observation in order to reduce reactivity, threats to reliability and validity and the need to operationalize the observation so that what counts as evidence is consistent, unambiguous and valid. For example, what constitutes a particular quality? Antisocial behavior? For example, what counts as antisocial behavior? One person's sociable is another's unsociable and vice versa. Then there is the need to choose the appropriate kind of structured observation and recording. For example, event sampling, instantaneous sampling, whole interval or partial interval recording, duration recording, dichotomous or rating scale recording and how to go undercover or whether informed consent is necessary, whether deception is justified, which roles to adopt on the continuum of complete participant to participant as observer to observer as participant, to complete observer, which role 
would be appropriate in that particular conditions and context? Well, uh, we started with uh, uh, data collecting technique and today our topic was using observation and uh, observation is uh, basically another substitute for uh, data collecting uh, other forms could, which we have discussed so far were the questionnaires and interviews. So these are traditional uh, ways of data collecting techniques and observation is one of uh, the techniques which is commonly used in all types of uh, research and in educational research and especially in um, in settings in a school setting are in uh, to test whether the students and teachers are uh, how to look at their behavior or to see one particular technique or method is appropriate or not or to see the behavior of the people, not the opinion of the people about, uh, about teaching. Many, many teachers can claim that they are very uh, good in teaching and they have a knowledge about different methodologies and they practice that one. It will be only by observing them in practical situations one can see whether what they say is true, what they believe, they practice or not. And that is a kind of a context in which observation would be uh, better or observation would be complementary and there would be a kind of triangulation, mixing of different uh, methods and different techniques uh, to reach a conclusion or uh, to reach a decision. Only one type won't be sufficient. So that is, uh, uh, that is one type of data collecting technique which could be used in connection with uh, either an interview or uh, a qu questionnaire. So we discussed, you see, a number of points that observation can be, what should be observed. So observation could be of the facts, or observation could be of the events, or observation could be of uh, behaviors or uh, qualities. And observation, uh, whatever observation would be taken, that observation is, uh, is produced as an evidence. And when an observation is produced, um, it becomes problematic how it should be presented as an evidence because whenever we observe something it depends on a number of things in a context for example where when and all those uh, WH questions that how long we look how many observers were involved and how we look. It also depends on what is taken to be evidence of or a proxy for an underlying uh, theme or construct. Then what counts as acceptable evidence of some social behavior? It requires an operational definition and when I say operational definition it means that uh, it should be presented in a way that it could be measured. Means what happens and what will happen which will be considered as, uh, a, as a social or unsocial behavior. So all the concepts which are abstract need to be defined with reference to some concrete examples 
what happens actually, what somebody does which would be considered as social behavior, unsocial behavior. Uh, in different cultures, in different communities, the concept of social or unsocial varies. So as a researcher, you need to define and give your own definition and the concept or a sense in which you will be using that one particular word or a phrase. So for observation purposes, obser observers need to decide what would be considered as an evidence. And uh, observations enable the researcher to gather data and that data is not limited to one particular situation. That uh, data can be collected by looking at the settings. For example, the physical environment and its organization. And it could be the human setting. For example, the organization of the people, the characteristics and makeup of the groups or individuals uh, being observed their class, their gender, and their social status. Then the interactional setting, the interactions that are taking place, interaction taking place between who, who are the participants, and the interaction is taking place whether in, in, in what settings, in, uh, in formal settings or in informal settings in a planned and orderly manner or in an unplanned or whether it is a verbal and unverbal that needs to be taken into account. And then there would be another kind of setting that would be the program setting. What are the resources and their organization or pattern? What are the teaching styles? What is the curriculum and their organizations? So observational data is not only confined towards the verbal behavior. It could be nonverbal behavior. It could be behavior in natural as well as in constructed or contrived settings. And it could be in not instantaneous but in longitudinal or in the longer studies. The kind of observations available to the researcher lie on a, on a continuum from structure to unstructure responses to uh, preordinate. So observation is just like uh, uh, interviews and in questionnaires as, as far as their structure or form is concerned. As we have uh, structured interviews and we have structured questionnaires, and we have unstructured interview, a semi-structured interview, and uh, uh, in the same way, we have uh, different types of observations. So observation could be highly structured, or it could be semi-structured, or it could be uh, unstructured. And there are definitions we have discussed in detail. Um, the other point I would like to say that about it is about the participants. The participants, uh, the participation could be of a different level. There could be an observer as a participant, a participant as an observer means that uh, the, the observer can become the part of the ongoing process. The phenomena is observing, he becomes part of the one and uh, he doesn't show his identity as a researcher, that could be one. He becomes friendly with them and the particip participants don't consider him to be a researcher rather they consider him to be uh, their colleague. And in this way, uh, the, re the researcher, the observer is also getting a data. Or they, it could be detached. 
the other extreme could be that uh, is hidden, is covered. He doesn't show his uh, uh, true identity, and uh, that depends on uh, we say the non-participatory, non-participant observation. So in that case, maybe observer can sit in a corner and watch from a higher place or from a different place or maybe hidden behind a curtain or just using a camera uh, to record it. So there are different ways of participation but basically we can say that is observant and uh, n observant participation where the, part, uh, where the observer participates or uh, there's a non-participatory observation. Uh, in the same way uh, that uh, there, there are different uh, uh, sheets used, I would like to draw your attention again towards the, the way observation sheet. So it, it should be properly structured uh, if it is a structured observation and um, there will be uh, a minimum of the notes required in the form of sentences or in the, sa in the form of words that would be in the form of some symbols as you can see in, in this uh, slide. Uh, where the the observer is just taking, uh, using some tick, or check, or a mark. Yeah, the check and marking, and uh, the interpretation is that for every every thirty second, seconds, what happens is noted down on a sheet of paper. Then th there was a need that we discussed. Uh, with reference to questionnaires, that there should be a pilot, a piloting in a uh, questionnaire. So there is a need to pilot a structured observation and uh, uh, any loopholes or weaknesses after the piloting should be removed. So we discussed uh, what is uh, observation and how observation can be used to collect data for your research. What are different types of observation, whether it is structured, unstructured, whether the, particip whether the observer is a participant or he is not part of the, uh, the, the people working with, and uh, then we discuss some of the uh, sheets or uh, the way the data could be recorded on different scales or uh, different ways in an observation sheet. And uh, we also discuss some of the guidelines to be kept while, um, while developing observation sheets or uh, while recording the data. So that's it for today. Um, thank you very much for listening. Allah Hafiz.